Well, thanks for having me. And as David said, my name is Trevor Tim, and by day I work at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. But at night, I am now executive director of this newly formed foundation called Freedom of the Press Foundation. And so I'm here to explain the origins of, of how we started and, more importantly, why we think our mission is so important, which is to protect, support, and defend media organizations that publish government secrets in the public interest. And so this kind of all starts back in late 2010 with a story I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but I'm just going to go over really quickly right now. Um, and that is when WikiLeaks, in conjunction with the New York Times and a Newspapers around the world started publishing the first of almost a quarter million State Department ca cables that we now know were leaked by private first class Bradley Manning. And there was, of course, a huge bipartisan uproar about this in the American political class with insanely hyperbolic statements from Joe Biden calling WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange a high-tech terrorist to Sarah Palin saying that we should hunt him down like Osama bin Laden. But Inflamed rhetoric aside, no one could really point to any tangible harm that were coming from these cables. In fact, we now know the cables actually contributed to the start of the Arab Spring and, and helped end the Iraq War. But more critically, no one could ever point to any law that WikiLeaks broke. But at the time, that didn't bother Senator Joe Lieberman and a couple other congressmen. Um, Joe Lieberman decided he didn't like what WikiLeaks was saying with its free speech rights, and he would try to censor them. And now, if, if Lieberman tried this, or anybody else in the U.S. government tried this, uh, through our court system, they would probably be actually laughed out of court, because in 1971, the Supreme Court ruled that the government couldn't issue censorship orders against papers. Um, you know, this case, the New York Times versus United States, was one of the most important First Amendment decisions in the last century. And it it came about when the New York Times was leaked the Pentagon Papers by whistleblower Daniel Ellsberg. Now, this was a 7,000-page study that was classified top secret, which is actually a higher classification than anything WikiLeaks has ever published. But so instead of going to court, Senator Lieberman decided to go another route, the extra-legal route. And so first, his staff called up Amazon, which was hosting WikiLeaks at the time, and asked them pointed questions about why they were supporting such an organization. And the next morning when Amazon announced that they would cut off WikiLeaks, Joe Lieberman went on television and declared victory. And after praising Amazon for his decision, he said, I call on any other company or organization that is hosting WikiLeaks to immediately terminate their relationship with them. And so after this and after Representative Peter King from the New York also made similar private overtures. Within the next few days, Visa, MasterCard, and PayPal, which uh, operate <clears throat> or which control 95% of the payment processors online, also cut off WikiLeaks, uh, basically cutting them off of any way of getting financial, financial support. And so with a wink and a nod and a little questioning of their patriotism, patriotism Senator Lieberman accomplished by unofficial means what the First Amendment never would have allowed him to do officially, which was to censor WikiLeaks, and in this case, financially. And so this financial blockade has crippled WikiLeaks for about two years now. Um, this is a graph of the money they were taking in before the blockade, and as you can see, in December 2010 and into January, there is just a giant drop-off into zero. But so, the question is, why should we care? You know. <clears throat> Contrary to what Joe Lieberman would have us believe, publishing government secrets is not a subversive act. It's actually as American as apple pie. Any given week, you can open up a newspaper in this country, whether it's the New York Times, Washington Post, or Wall Street Journal, and you can find classified information on its front pages. You know, sometimes it's information that the administration leaks on purpose for some sort of political gain. Sometimes it's because of turf wars between two agencies. <clears throat> but most critically, Sometimes it's whistleblowers getting information out there, exposing government waste, wrongdoing, or illegality. Now, under the Bush administration, we wouldn't have known about the NSA warrantless wiretapping program, or we wouldn't have known about its secret prisons and torture program if it wasn't for leaks from whistleblowers. Under the Obama administration, the same thing. We wouldn't know about President Obama's broad cyber attack powers, which he's used to go after Iran and other countries and potentially other countries, and or we wouldn't know about the 
broad CIA drone program, which has killed more than 4,000 people. So, in fact, actually, since in the last decade, there's probably been no major national security scandal which hasn't been uncovered by somebody leaking information to the press, and this information is something that the government officially considers secret. So what's going to prevent the government from using this tactic that they used on WikiLeaks next time? What's to prevent them from applying unofficial pressure to the New York Times in such the same manner? In such the same manner? So this could actually be a powerful precedent, even though we had never seen it before. So no longer would the government have to go to court to try to get a censorship order. They could starve organizations through financial censorship, financial censorship with unofficial agreements. So they've effectively found this digital loophole in the First Amendment. And so that's where Freedom of the Press Foundation comes in. So about four months ago, along with Pentagon Papers whistleblower Daniel Ellsberg, and J.P. Barlow, EFF's co-founder, and my colleague at EFF, Rainy Reitman, we co-founded this organization, which aims to take donations to organizations like WikiLeaks. And along with us, we have an awesome group of board members, including tomorrow's keynote speaker, Glenn Greenwald, uh, Boing Boing's editor, Jenny Jardin, and of course, actor John Cusack. And so on our website, you'll be able to take donations to WikiLeaks, and we will pass them along to WikiLeaks in a, in a semi-anonymous way. So actually, when you donate to us, you're donating to Freedom of the Press Foundation, um, and then we're passing it along. And the donation is fully tax deductible, and this is the first time in two years that US users have been allowed to do this with Visa, MasterCard, and PayPal. But that really only solves one part of the problem as we saw it. And the rest of the problem is what WikiLeaks tried to expose, which is, this secrecy system in this country that is bloated and broken and is the, allows the government to hide all sorts of wrongdoing. And so at this point, two years after WikiLeaks and four years after President Obama promised the most transparent administration in history, in many ways, government secrecy is at an all-time high. Uh, in 2011, the government classified 92 million documents. And to give you an idea about how crazy that is, in, in the start of the Bush administration, that number was at 8 million. And three years before that, there was a commission by Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan that called on the government to start um, declassifying its secrets, saying we had a secrecy epidemic. Yet it has increased over tenfold since then. And so we also have almost 5 million people that have security clearances in this country. That's the, about the size of the city of Chicago. And so we're at a point where um, what Justice Potter Stewart remarked in the Pentagon Papers case when he said, for when everything is classified, then nothing is classified. And the system becomes one to be disregarded by the cynical or careless and to be manipulated by those intent on self-protection or self-promotion. And we can see that playing out in the news today. And so let's take the CIA drone program, for example, which is on the front pages of the paper almost daily. Those little lines that you see up on, on the screen, each one of those lines signifies uh, one time that a government official, anonymous or otherwise, talked to a major newspaper about this classified program. This is from 2009 and 2010. This screen is from 2011 and the first half of 2012. I would guess if you take the next, uh, the nine months since, it would probably take up another two pages because the controversy has only increased. Yet, in court documents, the government actually refuses to even confirm or deny that this program exists. This is what they said uh, just two weeks ago um, in a court filing with the Court of Appeals in DC. And now, this same, the same tactic is used um, in suits about the NSA warrantless wiretapping program. It goes, same goes for details of the CIA torture program back in the 2000s when the government convinced uh, the U.S. courts not to allow victims to sue over it. Basically, they decide to st stamp state secrets on anything, and they think that they can get away without any accountability. And, you know, the biggest controversy recently was this legal memo, uh, which a white paper leaked of, which had... Uh, summarize the administration's um, supposed ability to uh, target and kill U.S. citizens abroad uh, with no due process. 
And this is actually only one of many secret legal opinions that the Justice Department has. And actually, they're so classified that they won't even tell us the number of opinions that they have classified. Um, so this is just one of many examples um, where they are trying to control the flow of information, and they only let the information that they want to leak get out. Um, but so what's preventing them from, or what's preventing more information from not coming out? Well, unfortunately, the Obama administration has prosecuted more whistleblowers in its four years than all of the other administrations combined. They've gone after six under the Espionage Act, um, and the previous administrations since the law passed in, in World War I have gone after exactly three. Um, another way that they get they control information is by pressuring newspapers to hold it even when uh, they know what's going on. A great example of this, again, is the NSA warrantless wiretapping program. The New York Times exposed this illegal program at the end of 2005, but what a lot of people don't know is they actually had this story for about 18 months. They had it all ready to go and could have printed it in the summer before the 2004 election between John Kerry and George Bush. And it really could have affected the, the public debate and caused real change. But the uh, Bush administration called the publishers of the New York Times into the White House and told them they'd have blood on their hands if they printed this information. So they held on to it. Finally, when they did print it, it obviously didn't end up hurting national security. And what it did lead to was congressional hearings and lawsuits and a Pulitzer Prize for the New York Times. But this type of, you know, sky is falling rhetoric is commonplace among government officials. But actually, as the new, the, the new editor-in-chief, Jill Abramson of the New York Times, summed it up perfectly a couple months ago when she said, no story about details of government secrets has come near to demonstrably hurting national security in decades and decades. And, but unfortunately, this hasn't stopped the Times from some sometimes partaking in this kind of needless self-censorship self on the government's behalf. You know, just uh, last month, there was a controversy where the New York Times and Washington Post knew about uh, a secret drone base in Saudi Arabia that w they were using to launch strikes in Yemen from, in including uh, killing three American citizens. And yet they inexplicably didn't publish this information for more than a year. It also doesn't help when news organizations are starving for cash in this digital economy. And some respected outlets have even been caught taking foreign money uh, from foreign, or sorry, taking money from foreign governments in exchange to thinly veiled public relations campaigns that have been masquerading as news. So the sum of all this from our perspective is that we don't need one WikiLeaks. We need 10 or we need 100. And so in addition to taking donations to WikiLeaks, the Freedom of the Press Foundation is going to take donations for, uh, to a variety of transparency journalism organizations, organizations that don't take advertising, that are dedicated to aggressively reporting on the truth in the face of adversity, and that those that use unique and innovative reporting methods that we haven't seen in a long time. So some of these will be leak sites, some of these uh, will be citizen journalism prog projects, some of them will be Freedom of Information Act experts, and others will just be old-fashioned investigative journalism. But what we hope, ultimately hope to inspire is more sites like WikiLeaks, where, where whistleblowers can go to safely and anonymously upload information that the public needs to know. And so right now on our site, you can uh, enter in the dollar amount that you wish to donate, and you can donate to up to four organizations at once. If you want, you can give all your money to WikiLeaks. All you do is take these sliders you see up on screen and, and drag them all the way over, or you can donate with one click to any number of these organizations. And what we're going to do is every two months we're going to switch out a, a, a different bundle of organizations because what we've found is that a lot of times people come for the controversy or they come to donate to WikiLeaks, but what they end up doing is starting to read about these other organizations and that they'd never heard of and donate to them too. So a great example is a group called Muckrock, which we supported um, with our first bundle. And <coughs> Muckrock is a great organization which uh, actually allows everybody to file their own Freedom of Information Act request for very cheap. And what they do is they see it through the system so it doesn't get unfairly rejected. And then once they get information back, they also report on it uh, with their reporters. So it, it's very 
citizen journalism base, but yet still has this, this professional journalism component to it. Um, and so what we've seen is that actually the organ, that WikiLeaks has turned into this tide that, that sort of rises all boats. And again, users can donate to these groups with a relative uh, amount of anonymity. You know, there was a big uh, problem when WikiLeaks first started that that people felt that you know they were very supportive of the idea, but they didn't want to end up on some sort of government watch list if they ended up donating to WikiLeaks. So what we allow people to do is donate to all these organizations, uh, and when they get their credit card statement back, it'll say Freedom of the Press Foundation. And you know we tried to actually write one of the best privacy policies on the internet. So you can go to our website and check it out. Um, basically, <clears throat> we try to delete everybody's logging information as soon as possible. And so once the checks go out uh, to these other organizations, uh, the only thing that we know is your email address. We don't know who you donated to or how much you donated. And so after about six weeks of doing this, we, we launched in the um, second half of December of 2012. We uh, raised almost $200,000 for these organizations. Uh, about 80,000, 85,000 went to WikiLeaks and the, the rest went to these other organizations and us. And so this, you know, wildly exceeded our expectations and gave us great hope for the future. But in a sense, that was kind of the easy part because, you know, we had generated a lot of good press and we had also launched in the middle of donation season. So it's kind of up to us to see if we can continue this success. And so for this bundle, we're taking things a step further. We have three or new organizations that you can fund. Um, and uh, along with that, they're also offering um, users specific secrecy busting investigations that they can fund um, so they know exactly where their, their money is going. And so this project um, is our lead project this time with the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. And if people don't know about the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, they started about uh, three years ago in the UK. They're a nonprofit and have been doing groundbreaking work on reporting on US drone strikes in Pakistan and Yemen. Um, and so they've started this project, which they call Naming the Dead. And so their goal is to positively identify um, through methodically collecting and reporting uh, information that they can share with the public ways or the you know the actual names of everybody that's been killed by a drone strike whether they're a militant or a civilian right now we only know 20 percent um the next group that we're supporting is truth out uh which is an, another independent media organization that takes that doesn't take advertising dollars and we're sending a reporter uh, to Guantanamo through them. Uh, it, I'm sure a lot of people have seen uh, the recent controversy about Guantanamo where there was a, a mysterious government censor who's been cutting off, who cut off the media's access to the courtroom or the uh, uh, listening device that was disguised as a, a um, smoke detector which was found in the attorney-client meeting rooms. Um, and the last group that we're supporting this time around is the Center for Public Integrity, which is actually one of the largest and oldest nonprofit journalism groups in the country. And they are trying to map secretive U.S. Pentagon spending, which, as we all know, we have the, by far the largest defense budget in the world. But they're trying to track where money goes from lobbyists to the influential politicians. And then when it goes into the system and we have cost overruns and effect and um, they're going to analyze the effectiveness of this, these various programs, which, you know, come out to about $700 billion a year. And so we're about halfway through this bundle right now, um, and we've raised about 40000 And um, so I would just ask that everybody donate if they can, um, but if they can't, just to spread the word, because that is um, all we need right now. Um, and so I'd just like to leave everybody with this quote, which has become sort of our motto. Um, it's from the Pentagon Papers case, actually the district court judge who was, uh, the Pentagon Papers case um, was his very first case. He was appointed by Richard Nixon a week before it came to him. And in the face of all this adversity, he said, a cantankerous press, an obstinate press, a ubiquitous press must be suffered by those in authority in order to preserve the even greater values of freedom of expression and the right of people to know. So thanks.